got a few questions for you, hoping to learn a few things from you today as well. And actually also, so during the talk, if you've got a question, if, if I say anything that isn't clear, or maybe you're, it doesn't make sense in some way, just put your hand up, ask me the question. Uh, for During the talk, what I'll do is I'll repeat the question for the purposes of the recording. Uh, and then we'll have some time at the end, hopefully, for some other questions. But try to save the, the in-depth questions for the end, just clarifying questions during the talk, if that's okay, just to make sure we get through everything. Is that okay? Awesome. Right, well, according to my laptop, it's still not 10.30, but I think we've got everyone in the room. So if we could get the door closed, because of the noise. Seems that they need a screwdriver to get the door closed. A crowbar? Wow. Normally, don't you need them to get the doors open? All right, well, look, we're going to start. So, good morning, everyone. How's the conference been for you so far? Good? Yeah? Learning a lot? Awesome. Um, I want to ask you guys some questions. Um, just a few things, just so I can get to know you a little bit better, and I'll tell you a bit about me, and then we're going to talk about some stuff. So I wonder how many people in the room here are testers? Uh, most of you. How many are developers? How many of you use Selenium day to day? Right, most of you. How many of you use Selenium by writing code? So why didn't you put your hands up when I said how many developers are in the room? So we're all developers, aren't we? We're writing code, surely. Would anyone disagree with that? No? Okay. See, I, I see it as, you know you have some developers who specialize in developing trading systems. Or you have some developers who specialize in developing mobile games. And some developers that develop iPhone apps. And some developers that specialize in trading systems. When we're writing code using Selenium, I see us as developers who specialize in test systems. We're writing test systems to test other systems. And it's still a, it is a business domain that we work in. And for me, learning as much as I can about object-oriented programming, good design principles, are just as important as learning about exploratory testing or combinatorial mathematics for, for testing purposes. Would anyone disagree with that? If we're writing code, is it also important to, to learn to be good at writing code? Excellent. How many of you have heard of solid design principles? S-O-L-I-D. Okay, if you put your hand up, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to tell me one of them. So put your hands up if you know solid. Fewer people, right? <laughs> Anyone? Oh, I've got one person, two people. Anyone? Solid. Oh, go on. Simon, tell, tell me, what does uh, S stand for? Single responsibility principle. Has anyone heard of that? What does that mean? Simon, go for it. That's right. Uh, uh, the single responsibility principle is that a class should have only one and one only responsibility. Another way of thinking about that is one reason to change. And what we're going to be talking about is some of the key design principles used in OO and how we can use those to move forward um, from where we are when we're using page objects. How many of you are using page objects? Right, cool. Right, so let's, let's, let's get on with it. Um, found out a bit about you, a little bit about me. I've been working in the software industry for over 20 years now. Um, and I've got the grey hairs to prove it. Um, I've earned every single one of them through the stresses of, uh, and pressures of having to deliver in tight timescales, just like all of us. And um, <clears throat> a long time ago, I started a website called Testing Reflections. Used to aggregate a lot of the stuff about agile testing on the web. Um, also worked with my colleague here, Andy Palmer, on uh, something called Pair With Us, which, was, uh, which is still out there. You can find it on Vimeo. It's like a live, uh, unedited 
screencast of two people pair programming, writing some stuff. At the time, it was ages ago, we were writing some stuff for fitness. And also, if you've read any of these books, like Agile Testing, Agile Coaching, Bridging the Communication Gap, you'll have seen my name in there in a few places, some sections I actually wrote. Um, so if you didn't know my name before and you've read those books, you might go back and say, oh, I know him. So we're going to talk about a little bit about page objects and how they came to be. And I'm really glad I've got Simon in the room because I'm going to challenge him to, uh, to uh, uh, recall a conversation we had in the pub one day uh, a few years back. <laughs> I, I can barely remember it, and I think he was a few drinks ahead of me that night, so uh, I'm not sure if he'll remember it, um, which is good because I can just make stuff up and you can't disagree. So um, We're going to talk about solids. What is it and why does it matter? And I'm going to introduce something called the screenplay pattern. Now, up until probably about six months ago, that was called the journey pattern, and that's because we didn't have a better name for it. But since then, we thought, actually, no, there's a better name, it makes more sense, and it's called the screenplay pattern. So if anyone's seen anyone talking or writing about uh, the journey pattern, uh, this is the same thing, and actually, you'll find out that it was something that actually I came up with in 2007. 2007 seems to have been quite an important year for some reason, I don't know why but people came up with lots of ideas in 2007. Simon, didn't you come up with an idea in 2007? Yeah. Vaguely. Yeah, something called WebDriver, I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, way back, way back when, when Selenium first came out, one of the <coughs> common complaints that people would say is that tests were flaky. They said, oh, Selenium, the framework, it's not good. It's buggy. It's got problems. My tests are failing for no reason. And um, people would complain about it a lot. And then I remember Simon actually wrote this. I don't think he was drinking at the time. I think Stone this was... Stone cold sober. Stone cold sober, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and his point was that Selenium was not unstable. The problem actually was that the tests and the programming practices used in writing the tests were causing the problem. And the problems were coming about through duplication, because people were writing the same series of steps in many different tests. If they wanted to register a user, for example, they kept repeating the, the steps for registering a user in every test where they needed to register a user, rather than putting them in one place. And that was the common characteristic. Duplication was one of the common characteristics in environments where they complained about flaky tests. I know, because I was often asked to come in and say, please help us sort out our tests, they're really flaky. And I'm like, well, that's because over here, you've got a slightly different way of doing this, but they're basically the same, and we'd find all these issues. And Simon talked about that around, uh, around the same time. Um, so what, 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 what is a page object, and, and how does that help us? So let's imagine an application like this. It's hard to see there, but at the top, you've got to-dos, and it says uh, you've got a place to enter the to-dos. It doesn't come out very well on the projector, unfortunately. You've got a place to um, uh, write to-dos. Uh, one of the to-dos might be to walk the dog, and this to-do here was something else, which I can see here, buy some milk, uh, and that to-do item has been done. So let's imagine an app application that allows you to manage your to-do list. Pretty straightforward, okay? Hardly anything there. You can imagine a page object for that page would be quite so small and simple, yeah? Would you agree? Hmm. Let's see. Let's see if what your idea is small and my idea of small is the same. Anyway, so what's a page object? So a page object, oh God, this comes out bad on this. Can you change, can, is there a way of changing the projector co co contrast? Hello? Is, is it possible to change the contrast on this? It's very, the contrast or the, it's too, it's too bright on here. On the projector, yeah? Thank you. So while he's trying to do that, so this might be something along the lines of a page object, a to-do list page. You've got the ways in which we can find the elements on the page, at, um, which would be the fields that we'd have on it. And then we'd have a bunch of methods for all the different things you can do on that page. Yeah, I'm not going to show you the page object for this because I didn't actually write one, because I don't work with page objects. I don't use them anymore. So, so you see you've got how we find the page elements, and the tasks that a user can complete on that page. Is that a fair way of describing what a page object is? Would anyone have a different way of describing it? So how to find stuff and what we can do. Yeah? Cool. I looked around the interweb and 
And what I found was quite a few different interesting examples of page objects. Um, put this to one side for a second, and I found uh, this, this particular example somewhere. It was on GitHub. And uh, just a kind of typical example, you've got some ways of finding the elements on the page, and here's how you add a customer. Um, now, what I did then is I zoomed out on that particular class to see how, you know, what that class looked like. And this, this for, was for a very simple web app um, page. It didn't really do very many things, about five or six things. Uh, but it ended up looking like that. Can anyone tell me what's wrong with this? Verbose? Mm, let's go back and have a look. Not really. It kind of does what it has to do. It types stuff into the page. It clicks. Yes, too, too many things on the page, too much here, makes it really hard to find. So when, when you want to add some functionality, you've got to find where in this do I make that, or if you want to change some, the way something works, you've got to find where in this do I change it, and it's, you've got to have to search and control F. And that all takes time. There's a book called Clean Code by um, Robert Martin, or Robert C. Martin, affectionately known as Uncle Bob. Has anyone heard of the Clean Code book? Yeah, it's good, it's good, there's a good set of principles in there. And one of the things that you know, he talks about is that you should be able to understand what a method does within a few seconds of arriving at that method. You should understand how it does it as well within a few seconds of arriving at that method. And you should be able to understand a whole class within a few minutes. But if you're sitting here for half an hour trying to understand what's going on here before you know what's changed, that's making your, the time it takes to add each test take longer. Yeah? <coughs> cool. So there's another useful mechanism that I use when I'm looking at code and I think, how can I learn, um, how, can I d how can I figure out what's wrong with this? Because actually when you look at that class in detail, there's quite a few different things that are wrong with it. And there's this concept called code smells. Has anyone heard of code smells? Yeah? Name, anyone name a code smell? God objects, yes, sorry, I, I couldn't hear you very well. Yes, so God objects, another one? A lot of methods in the class. I don't know if that's a named smell, but yeah. There's, there's a name for that one, which is, uh, but that's cool, sorry? So a long method, yeah, that's another example of a code smell. Which one do you think applies here? Right, the, the smell here is, the, is large class, because it's, it's a large class. And all that does, it's not, it's, all that's doing is it's telling us that there's a potential problem, a deeper problem. And it might be that what we've got in there is duplication. It might be that we are um, uh, using more lines of code than is necessary to say a very simple thing, which we've seen uh, on, on our travels many a time. So when we, when we when we detect that there's a smell in our code, like large class, um, then there are some tools that can help, help us, thinking tools that can help us solve that problem. But one of the challenges is, how do you know when it's a large class? I mean, how big is a large class? How many, how many lines do you think is, what do you think is a reasonable size for a, a, a Java class? Anyone? Let, let's say, let's say, Let's say a thousand lines of code. Is that okay? Uh, okay, five uh, hundred. Yeah. So let's do this. Everyone, put your hands up. Okay. Put your hands up. Put your hands up. Okay. Keep your hands up. Everyone, come on. Everyone, hands up. Everyone, everyone, everyone. All right. All right. Keep your hands up. If I've said a number that is okay for a large class. 10 lines of code, is that okay? 20? Why? For a whole class, 20 lines is too big. I, I, I don't know, I'm not sure about that, let's see. 30, 40, 50, oh, got people putting their hands now, 60, 70 is okay, 80 is okay, 100, Oh, 100 have gone down. 
150. 200 is okay. Okay, right. Interesting. So we've all got a different idea of what, what is too big for a Java class. And that's a very interesting uh, problem because often when we're working with teams, getting the teams just to agree on at what point should we really think about refactoring this class and actually breaking it up into something smaller. And that's one of the first things you've got to, to get to. Um, many, many, many millions of years ago, um, there was a sort of a general rule that uh, a, a class, well, a, a, a module should fit on a single screen. Now, screens were a lot smaller. They were very low resolution in those days. So only very few lines of code could fit on the screen. Now, with huge screens and high resolutions, we can fit a lot on a screen. So um, it was uh, James uh, Lewis, James Lewis, uh, the guy who's better known for talking about microservices, uh, says that uh, a, a Java class should be no bigger than his head. So it doesn't matter how many lines. For us, that's probably about 40 or 50. If you've got a pretty big head, maybe it's a bit more. But a Java class should be no bigger than your head. Okay. Has anyone in here been told that they've got a big head? No? Yeah. For anyone that missed that, this, uh, if, if, you're, if you have a big ego, so that's why Simon put his hand up. Cool. So what can we do to arrive at a better design for that page object? So there's some key principles that we can use. These were talked about, um, I, th I think it was in the early 2000s. Um, you'll find these in a book called um, Principles of Object-Oriented Design by, again, Robert C. Martin. But this solid acronym was arrived at by someone called Michael Feathers, who wrote a very good book about working effectively with legacy code. So the single, the, the SOLID is an acronym to help us remember the single responsibility principle, the open closed principle, the Liskov su substitution principle, interface segregation principle, and the dependency inversion principle. Now you've probably used many of these without realizing it if you don't already know them. If you do know them, then maybe you're, you're using them and you recognize that you use them. But because we've got limited time, what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus only on the first two. And for me personally, and for my colleague Andy, who I work with um, a lot, um, um, we, we find that these two are the sort of predominant principles that we find emerging when we start to refactor classes, particularly large classes. So let's look at the first one, the single responsibility principle. So this is a definition of it from Robert Martin. But as I said before, the main thing is there should be one reason to change a class, only one reason. The open-closed principle, this is a definition again, <clears throat> and it says that a class should be open for extension but closed for modification. What that means is, if I want to add new functionality, I should be able to write a separate class, add that to my code base, and it should just work. I shouldn't change any existing classes. Okay. So let's have a look at those two. We're gonna see what happens when we take um, uh, a page object conceptually, because not, I know not, not everybody spends a lot of time working with code. So we look at conceptually how this might uh, play out. Let's go back to this page object that we had before, which was the to-do list page, and it's got some ways of finding stuff and some ways of doing stuff. How many reasons can you see for this to change? General reasons, not specific. Any suggestions? The clues in the name, the single responsibility principle. If it has more than one responsibility, it has more than one reason to change. So if the way in which you find an element changes, it has to change. If the way you do something has to change, it has to change. So that's two reasons, straight away. Yeah, would, would you agree? Okay. So if we were gonna split this class up, one of the things that we could do is separate it so that there are, uh, there's only one reason for it to change. For example, how to find the page elements or how a, a user completes a given, a given task on that page. So let's take a look at what you might do. So for something like that, um, you might um, sort of just take out all of the elements and the references to them, put them in one place, and the, the things that you can do on that page and put it in another place. 
So who, who can tell me what refactoring is? Anyone? So refactoring is improving the internal design of something without changing the external behavior. So our tests would still work if we separated these two things out. It's just that this would have to refer to that class. That's the, the only thing, but the test would still work. So the behavior would stay the same, but we're separating it out. So it should theoretically be easier. Now, the thing is, this is basically just data, and we might represent it in a class, we might represent it in enum now. We might even put it into a properties file or a JSON file and load it dynamically, because really that's just data, that's just some names for things and the selectors that we're gonna to use to find them. So, so let's just put that to one side, because that's just data now, as far as I'm concerned. So let's look over here. Do we think that's got, how many reasons do you think that's got to change at the moment? So if the way that we add a to-do item changes, it changes, because that, that, that method will have to change. If the way that we filter items changes, that class has to change. So now we've got, uh, we've, I've listed four different reasons for it to change now, because how we do each of those tasks um, is gonna change. So again, the single responsibility principle would lead us to split that up. However, what if we said, hmm, no, that feels uncomfortable, so let's go back again, let's start over, let's try a different refactoring. So um, let's see what happens when we split it up based on the things that it does. So now we've got a new to-do up here, and it's got the, the, the way you find the element, the new to-do element, and how you add a to-do item, and how you add multiple to-do items. Now this is actually a lot more like the way Martin Fowler describes page objects. So if you do a search for uh, Martin Fowler page objects. He talks about page objects more as objects on a page rather than objects that represent a page. So rather than it being the whole page, they are the objects or the widgets we find on the page. That's the way that Martin Fowler describes it. And that was inspired by the work that, um, that um, uh, Simon did quite some, you know, back in, back in the day. So this is another way you could split things up. And now, if the way that we add new to-dos changes, then we only change that. If the way that we add, uh, we maintain the to-dos by saying marking what's complete, what's incomplete, then we only change that. Probably a better split altogether. All and actually, the teams that I've worked with that had, have had the least maintenance problems with page objects have generally used this type of approach. But there's another way of splitting these up that makes it even easier. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that uh, this now doesn't satisfy the open-closed principle. So it kind of satisfies the single responsibility principle, but not the open-closed, because if we want to um, add a, a way of maintaining our to-dos, we now have to change that class. If we change the way that we maintain to-dos, we have to change that class. Now we've got two different reasons for it to change, so we need to split them out a little bit more. So the refactorings, the named refactorings we'd apply here are extract class and a lesser known one, or a lesser, lesser referred to one in my experience is the replace method with method object. What that means is we'll take a method, extract it, and put it in a class of its own. So that whole, that one method becomes a class in its own right. So if you think about it, these are task classes because each of them describes how to complete a given user task. Make sense? Now, again, for me, this is just data. It's, an, it's a, a mapping of names to selectors. That's just data. If that was in a class or an enum or even dynamically loaded from JSON, it doesn't really matter to me. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at changing that because it's just a data object now. It doesn't really have any behavior as such. But these do have behavior. So now, if the way that we change how we add a to-do item changes, then we change that. So it's only got one re that one, thank you. So if, if the way that we change how we add a single to-do item changes, then we only change that class. That's the only thing that changes, nothing else. Now it's only got one reason to change. Also, if we add new functionality to the page, there is a new task that you can complete. We add a new class. We don't have to modify anything, so they're open for extension, but closed for modification. We don't change them as such. And in fact, technically, I could change the behavior of this by writing a new class that wraps that class and hides it away 
and adds the new functionality around it. So again, it satisfies the open close principle. So are there any questions so far? So this is this this to me, this is this is just good OO design applied to page objects. And when a page object is small, probably leave it as it is. But once it starts to get bigger, especially if it gets close to being the same size as your head, that's the time to look at splitting it up. And I hope I've introduced you to some ways of doing that. I'm going to go on to, to some more in-depth stuff about showing you what this looks like in practice. But are there any questions to clarify what I've said so far? I saw a hand here. That's a fantastic idea. Let's take a look at something like that in about five minutes' time. And that's exactly what you do. So if you have something that you can give the task to that, that expects a performable interface, and that performable interface has the perform method on it, then it, they'll, they'll work. You can just have one thing that knows how to perform tasks, and that's it. So we're, we're going to come back to exactly that in, in a few minutes. Any other clarifying questions? This, this one calls that one by iterating over a list. There was another hand up just here. Yes, you will have more objects, more individual objects. So, and I'm going to address that shortly. I'll show you, I'll show you the, uh, how that affects the ability to discover what, what a thing does. Good. Okay, any more? What would happen to the base page object? Would you even need one anymore? You might not need one. What you might have is you might have a, an abstract task that does any of the common things for tasks, um, but the, the, the concept of a page object would cease to exist, so you wouldn't have a base page object anymore. Any, any common behavior between all of the tasks, you could solve by having a parent task, an abstract task, that these all inherited from. You could, but you wouldn't need to. And one of the key things that's coming out here is that we're favoring a concept called composition over inheritance, and that's another positive um, programming principle for OO. That way we can add common functionality by composing a class. So the task could have, uh, could be, uh, constructed by injecting a, um, a common task, common user task, and it could use that to, to provide the, the common behavior. So then you don't have any inheritance. When you have inheritance, has anyone experienced where you have like, you know, parent classes and child classes and more child classes? Have you found that as soon as you want to change something somewhere in the middle, it suddenly becomes a very painful process? Whereas when you compose the objects, they're all much more... Um, uh, malleable and, and, and movable. You can move things around in, in one place and it doesn't hurt you in others. So in the interest of time, I have to move on. So we're pretty close. I think we're pretty close. I think we're all kind of roughly on the same page here. Sorry, I couldn't resist that. Right, so there's another problem. One other problem. And sorry, Simon, this is something that's always bugged me about page objects. And, but this is just a personal preference thing. So it's not right or wrong. It's just something that bugs me. Can someone, uh, someone, who knows how to use Google? Anyone? Put your hand up, anyone? Okay, this gentleman here. So you know how to use Google. Can you explain to me um, just how, how, would I find, how would I find information about page objects? Go to the Google page. Fill in my question. Selenium page objects. Yeah, I'll fill in my question, Selenium page objects, and click search. Okay, brilliant. So you told, and, and what, what am I? What am I? A, a person? Yeah, it's, the person's good. I'm a person. I'm a person. Am I, am I a browser? No. Am I a driver? Yes, I do drive cars, but am I a web driver? No. Okay. Now, this, is a per this is only a personal preference and a personal style thing. For some, you create the thing, and every time you call a method, you're sending a message to that thing, and, and that thing is under your control. 
But one of the other things that we can do, um, and this is an idea borrowed from domain-driven design, if, if anyone's ever heard of that, or if you haven't, feel free to look it up. It's a very interesting book about how we can incorporate the thinking around the problem domain all the way through, through our code base. But for me, what I'm trying to model in my test is a user. Yeah, I'm going to be telling a user to go to the home page, enter the, uh, your, your question, and click search. That's, that's, I'm going to be talking to a user. So one of the things that, that that thinking can do for us is, well, you can just apply that in how you name your, your variable. So when you create your web driver, that could just be a user, and then suddenly all the methods just read exactly like you're talking to a user anyway. And that, that works perfectly well. However, just going back to the suggestion this gentleman made about what if we had something that could just execute tasks? So let's have a look at something that comes from um, user interface design. So there's a, something called task analysis. And this is something that people that do training, people that do user interface design and user experience design um, will sometimes use. What they use is this uh, concept of uh, trying to understand the role of the person, like who is it for, what is it that they're going to, you know, and then what's their goal? So what are they trying to achieve as an outcome? So when they're designing the user interface, they want to know who it is, what they're trying, wh why they are there, and what they're trying to achieve as an outcome, what tasks they need to complete to achieve those goals, and for each task, what actions or interactions, like click, type, etc., what interactions will they perform in order to complete each task? So if we take that, that model, that thinking of a, a user, or let's say an actor who's playing the role of a user, um, then what we end up with is this kind of mindset where your test script is essentially a narrative for each scenario, each test scenario. You can have a cast of actors playing the roles. Each actor can perform tasks, and those tasks involve interactions which they perform with their abilities. So for example, I have the ability to browse the web. I have the skills of knowing how to start a browser, interact with a browser, click on things, type things, and so on. And when you apply the same principles to refactoring the, the page objects to, and, and, and domain-driven design thinking, when you think of the domain like this, what you end up with is something else which we call the screenplay pattern. And we call it the screenplay pattern because you have actors and your test script is like the, the play. They're playing roles. Sometimes an actor can be a, a supervisor user. Sometimes an actor can be a, a, a book buyer. Sometimes an actor can be different roles. The idea is that we have an actor that performs tasks. That was his idea, by the way. I just quickly implemented that just two minutes ago, because he said I should have an interface for tasks, which I do. Um, so actors perform tasks. Tasks are composed of actions. Actors perform action with their abilities. They can also ask questions, and all of this stuff can be done on the elements of a screen. So let's look at a real example as we bring it to a conclusion. So let's take a user story like this. We have James, the just-in-time kind of guy, and he wants to capture the most important things that he needs to do so that he doesn't leave so many things until the last minute. That should actually say Anthony, because I am notorious for leaving things until the last minute. Uh, have you heard the phrase, leaving things until the last responsible moment? Have you heard that phrase in agile development? <coughs> OK, I'm, I'm the guy who leaves it till the last irresponsible moment. So this application was literally made for me. So let's say this is what our test could look like if we were writing it in code. If you like working with BDD type um, language, then you can have given that James was able to start with an empty to-do list. Or you could just say James attempts to start with an empty to-do list. You don't need the given that. Now start with an empty to-do list is a task. So how many of you write, write code in Java? Most of you, a lot of you, most of you. Um, how many of you use the sort of um, assert that type assertions? Yeah, from Hamcrest, yeah? OK. Then you're used to working with things in this way. Do you know how Hamcrest works? So when you say, when you say um, assert that something, comma, is equal to, what happens then, equal to, uh, the method equal to doesn't actually um, compare things. What it does is it creates an instance of an equal to matcher populated with the value that you've given it. And then what happens is the assert that method takes the expected result and the, the matcher and puts them together. 
And that's exactly how this is working. It's exactly the same principle. So this gives you back an instance of a start with an empty to-do list task. This one gives you back an instance of an add a to-do item task. This gives you back an instance of the items uh, displayed question. And there you go, look, handcrest matcher, right there. So what this thing is really doing here is it's just saying, this is my expectation, and it's comprised of a question, which is the items displayed, and a handcrest matcher, and the result of those two is brought together. So when, has anyone ever written a custom handcrest matcher? A couple of people, right. So sometimes you can write, you can actually write um, handcrest matches as well in handcrest. So when you want to add new functionality to handcrest, you don't have to edit an existing file, you just write a new class. What principle does that satisfy? Open, closed principle, exactly. So it's exactly the same principle that we're applying here. Now these examples are actually in a, uh, already implemented in a framework called Serenity. So a colleague of ours called John Ferguson Smart um, worked with us, we showed him how to do this stuff, and he was so excited about it, he implemented it in Serenity. Uh, there's a few other places that has been in, implemented over the years uh, in various open source frameworks, but the amount of code that you actually need to make this work is so small that you don't really, it almost doesn't justify having an open source framework. You can almost do it yourself. Uh, but if you want to see how to get started, some of the examples are in a link at the end of the slide deck. So let's look at how we could create our, our actor. Where did James come from? So James is an actor, we're gonna call him James because we're gonna use that in some reporting features in Serenity, but that's just coincidental. And we're gonna tell James, here's, here's what you can do. You have the ability to browse the web. And browse the web is really just a wrapper around WebDriver. You know, that's where the WebDriver functionality exists, that we can reach, in, reach, in, reach, out, and reach out to our ability to use, browse the web and apply the, the skills that we require. So what we can do, we have an actor, and now we can give him an ability. <clears throat> this is what your page object would be reduced to. It's just some data saying, here's some names of things, and here's how I'm gonna find them. In Serenity, that it so happens that there's some extra reporting information. So here where it says uh, what needs to be done, that's just something that's gonna be entered into the reporting. But really all we're gonna look at here is this is the CSS selector and this is the name we're gonna use uh, to use that CSS selector and we'll, we'll, we'll get that data and we'll use our abilities later to, to get stuff from the page. And on this particular subject here, really we shouldn't even need to, to, to say this much and actually if you're at the end of this talk in room three, after this talk, is another talk by Andy Palmer on a concept called robot handles which I highly recommend you go to see because it re dramatically reduces the amount of code you have to write in your tests when you're trying to explain how you interact with a page. So room three, straight after this at 11.30, highly recommend Andy Palmer's talk. Um, so here, instead of a method, we now have a to-do item class. Yeah? So instead of a add a to-do item method on a page object, this is a task object. Remember we talked about the extract method to method object, that's what this is. Now what we, what we tend to do, because we find that the information that people are most interested in is actually this information at the top. So how is it, how do you add a new to-do item? That's what people are mostly interested in. So if you have a constructor, like down here, or a factory method, like here, that makes it, makes it read a little nicer in, in, the, in the implementation. We tend to put those at the bottom for the task classes. And if they're all like that and they're consistent, people get used to it very quickly. But usually what you're interested in is the information at the top. Now, this is interesting. This thing here is a, a, a lower level of a performable activity. And this is an action. So what this is doing here is exactly the same method. Again, it's the actor, we pass the actor in. The actor attempts to complete this particular task. What this does, it returns an instance of an enter text uh, interaction. It's performable, but it's an interaction. Um, and then it defers the execution of that and then executes it afterwards. So it works in exactly the same way. And and if you want to look at the implementation of how that works, what that's doing is that's wrapping up um, the, the, what in, the interactions you make with the WebDriver API. Any questions about this? Yeah. 
This isn't an anonymous class, this is an actual class file. No, that's an also an actual class file somewhere. That's not an anonymous class. There is actually a class called enter the value. Sorry? And this, yeah, this calls, this, this method here is a factory method, so it creates an instance of entering text, and then you build, build upon that using a builder pattern where you build onto it what text you want it to enter, and then any subsequent interaction. So you can say then hit tab or then hit return, you know. So, so this is, this is a creating an instance of an action, which is like a task, it's performable. But again, it, it will look almost exactly like this, except instead of implementing task, it implements action. That's the only difference. But both of them are performable. So you can pass either one of them into the actor, and the actor doesn't really care whether it's a task or an action. It will perform it either way. And, that, and that's the, thing, the cool thing with the actor. I mean, you can uh, have a look at the code afterwards in, in the example code um, in the link at the end. Um, you'll see it doesn't take a lot of code to make this stuff work. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in, the, in Serenity's implementation because there's a lot of instrumentation and reporting stuff that's been layered on top of it. But, but in, in order to just do that, uh, another place you can look is Generate. So if you Google Generate and in my name, you'll find some code for that. That's a reference implementation of this model. Um, and you'll see in there that actually it doesn't take very much code at all to make this. So you could almost write it yourself probably in less than a day. So going back to the point of don't you have a lot of classes? Yeah, you will end up with more classes. But if you organize them effectively, it's actually easier to find out what are the different things that I can do. Because you can just look at, oh, well, what are the different tasks? You can, if you have more tasks, you can divide that folder up into smaller, smaller groupings of tasks. Um, and if you're using a modern IDE um, and you start, you just, instead of having to do dots and seeing what can I do on this page, you're no longer restricted to that page. You just start typing, well, I want to add a to-do item. If you're using IntelliJ, it will give you a suggestion of all the tasks that start with add. Uh, so you, the discoverability problem is, not, is a, is a non-issue. Uh, and actually, it makes, makes your test more flexible because you don't always have to necessarily get to a particular page before you can get started on the next thing. There's some other interesting things you can do. So you can write alternative implementations of adding a to-do item which can just use the REST API, and then you can swap them in and out. That's another mechanism that this allows you to do. So if, if you, what we, what we would generally want to do is for, you know, a given, like for the given part of given when then, anything that you do in the given, we'd want to do that via the APIs. We'd never want to go via the front end. It's only the when that we might want to do, for, we might want to do via the front end, but not always. So this is how you might end up with, this is the kind of folder structure you might end up with. So in summary, what I've been trying to do is, is point out that, that page objects are really, really useful as training wheels, as a place to start. While they're small, they're easy to work with. But as most of us work on quite large-scale systems with pages that do quite a few different things, and also the concept of a single page web application where that one page does everything, it becomes quite difficult. So the way in which, once the page object grows beyond a certain point, we can start to split it up. Because as we try to go faster and faster and faster and these page objects grow and grow and grow, it's actually going to slow us down. And I'm sure you've all experienced it, but couldn't necessarily explain exactly why. But everyone was using page objects, and everyone was using these inheritance hierarchies, so it must be the right way of doing it. But when we apply principles like the, the S and the O, just those two things, from the solid OO design principles, fundamental principles that have been around for at least 15 years now, then it can help us remove the training wheels and arrive at much better design code. Now, the screenplay pattern is a, could be a place to start. It's a way in which you could rather almost bypass the process of having to refactor. And you could consider experimenting with starting to write your new tests using this alongside your existing page objects. And bit by bit, the new test would take over the old ones in a, in a new and better way. Or you could try and refactor your existing page objects. Whichever way works for you, whatever you do, don't try and replace it all at once. And that's the end of my talk for today. Thank you very much.
Right, we've got two minutes, so I can take some questions. We have someone with a microphone who can run around and. Uh, so if you're gonna, if you're gonna, if you want to see him run a lot, then um, make sure you've got people with hands up on this side and on this side, and then we'll make the guy run backward and forward. If you want to be kind to him, then we'll we'll just try and work our way across gradually. So any questions on this side of the room? Any questions? Any questions? Question. I'm sorry. Can you just turn the mic towards your mouth a bit? The application uses frames. Uh huh. The the focus of what we've I've tried to get across is more about if you think about it in terms of describing what the user's doing rather than describing what the implementation is doing then what the screen looks like doesn't matter as much anymore because all of the web driver code gets put down really close to where the browser is and then you're abstracted from that and then your tests are expressed in terms of you know who are you what are you trying to do and what do you expect to happen at the end of it um, whereas the web driver part is how do we make the computer do that for us? Yeah. Yeah. So, so it can be done, but you know uh, how you interact with it with WebDriver is exactly the same way that you'd interact with this. But that's happening so that's like about three layers below. You're abstracted away from that. Now you have to implement that. But however you get objects from the page and then click on them at the moment is exactly the same way that this works. There's a. I'll give you a link right now. Uh, these, these are going to go online. On a pro there's a very lengthy article that pretty much says everything I've said today, but a lot better, um, at that bit.ly link, the first one, uh, bit, bit.ly slash rg hyphen screenplay. And uh, the examples from today are, are bit.ly slash rg hyphen serenity hyphen eg. And uh, in there, what you'll see is you'll be able to work your way through the, the, the layers of abstraction to find where you eventually get to where the web driver is 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 uh, the you know the part where we help the computer know how to talk to the comp the other parts of the computer, but in terms of how we communicate uh, uh, in terms of writing our tests and express what the users are trying to achieve. And the other cool thing about this is it starts the process of 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 just gradually getting us a little bit further away from the details of how the how the application is built. So if if the way that you navigate through the application to register changes, you change that in the registration class, and that's it, and everything just works. And then when the design of the, 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 the location of things or the things being split across multiple pages is a much less painful activity than if you've already encoded your entire registration process into one page. And then, oh, some UX person says, no, it should be more like a wizard experience. Now we're going to split it off into these four different things. This makes it a lot easier to cope with that. And actually, on that note, I'll just re-plug Andy Palmer's talk on robot handles. Uh, it, that will make it even easier still, so I do recommend that. Any more questions? Hello. We've got someone with a microphone. Here. Uh, so by the way, uh, composition. Yep. So this will be the last question, by the way. Sorry. So how much composition is, uh, uh, for example, if I have a thousand line of They may be used in a single page, but they may be called from different places. So, I, you know, as a general rule, if if a block of code is only called from within one class, it probably should stay in that class. But um, if it's called from multiple places, then it should probably exist on its own. And what will happen is, you won't necessarily know what, what those methods are. But if you first extract method, so a private method within that class, and then what will happen is you'll say, actually, this whole block of code here needs to be separated out and as, a, as it's a class in its own. And then suddenly you'll find, oh, this method goes with it. Oh, OK. But it's still only called over here. Then you'll take this block of code, then you'll move it somewhere else, and then you'll find, ah, well, this one, this um, block of code 
and a block of code in here needs that method. So now that comes out into its own thing. So it's a very gradual process of refactoring. I'm not going to be able to go into more details today. I will be around uh, today and tomorrow, so do ask me. But one of the books I highly recommend for that is a book called Refactoring to Patterns, which takes you through the process of refactoring from, here's a whole bunch of code, and how do I get it to smaller things? And another book called Working Effectively with Legacy Code, um, which talks about the seam model. So if you're looking for seams in your code where you can sort of um, separate it, move it out, and piece by piece, you're, you're refactoring gradually. So that's all we've got time for today. But thank you again. Thanks for coming. And make sure you go to Andy's Robot Handles talk. Thank you.